Good morning. Sorry for the delay. This Senate Education Committee meeting is called to order. Today is Wednesday, April 6, 2022. The time is 9.08 a.m. We're meeting in State Cap Room number 205. Senators in attendance are Senator Hughes, Senator Stevens, myself as Chair, Senator Holland. I do believe Senator Begich uh, is, I have him on. Uh, I'm two. online. Ah, there you are. All right, Senator Begich, glad to hear. Um, sorry <coughs> to hear the conditions you're joining us under, but glad to hear you're able to make it. Um, the uh, Senator Machiki uh, may not be able to join us today. We're still waiting to see. We do have a quorum to conduct business, though. Thank you to Mary Gwen, our recording secretary, and Kelsey, our moderator for today. As a reminder, please silence your cell phones if you have them on board. At this time, I will bring Senate Bill 140 back before the committee. Senate Bill 140 is related to Title IX and the promise of equal access to athletic programs. This is the third hearing on Senate Bill 140. Senator Hughes, would you care to take the presenter's table and offer any opening remarks and bring up any staff you, you care to uh, have join you? Thank you and good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Shelley Hughes, Senator for District F, Tugak and Palmer, and with me is my aide, Daniel Phelps, and we appreciate you all um, bringing SB 140 and hearing it today. So um, the spirit of SB 140, we, we had a, a, a lively discussion about it last time, but it is, just as a reminder, it's rooted in Title IX which prohibits discrimination based on sex in education programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. My bill is designed to maintain the integrity of Title IX by protecting women and girls in school athletic programs and allowing them to compete on an even playing field against other women. Some have accused my bill of discriminating <coughs> against individuals who may choose an identity um, differing from their biological sex. This is an unfounded allegation. This legislation is actually neutral in regard to gender identity. Personally, I accept, value, and love everyone, but the issue at hand here is not acceptance, it is fair competition. School sports and athletic programs center around competition, and the ability of women and girls to compete fairly is at risk as a result of male-bodied athletes who are being allowed to compete on women's and girls' sports teams across the country over a range of grade levels. This bill seeks to address that concern by basing membership on a woman or girls' team on the participants' biological sex, which can be found on the birth certificates of participants issued at or near the time of their birth, which, by the way, are required for enrollment in our public schools in Alaska. Um, I, I want to make it clear that this bill is not excluding anyone from participation. Every single student, every student, Mr. Chair, will have two options. The person can either participate on a team in alignment with his or her biological sex, or the person can um, choose to play on a co-ed team. I appreciate the many concerns and suggestions brought forward by members, and my office has prepared a number of amendments to address and strengthen the bill. And I'm confident that through the course of amendments and our questions and answers in this committee today, that SB 140 will prove to be constitutionally sound. I, I might note um, for the members and those listening that we do have multiple years of experience and work uh, that are behind this bill um, through our expert attorneys that um, we'll be hearing from. And um, I consider these attorneys to be constitutional scholars in this arena. They've spent years. Um, one has spent, I believe, a couple decades on Title IX issues. And they understand federal law uh, like the back of their hand as well as case law. And I, I think we, we will have some answers to members' questions. I want to note also this, this bill is, is not about divisiveness and polarization. It's actually all about inclusion, making sure every student athlete has an opportunity for uh, a fair opportunity. And I also want to let members know that I've heard from individuals from across the uh, political spectrum. I've had re Democrats as well as Republicans, as well as nonpartisans, undeclareds, tell me they're in full support. I've heard from um, 
women who have been longtime feminists. I've heard from actually several transgender women that are in support of this bill. So I, I just want to make it clear, um, this is to make sure that we're allowing every student to be included on a team, um, if they so choose, that will give them a fair opportunity. So with that, um, um, Mr. Chair, I, I believe that uh, Senator Stevens had requested a foundation um, of Title IX, and our um, one of our attorneys, Jennifer Brosseros, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, is prepared to do that if that's your wish, um, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Senator Hughes. Are there any questions from the committee for the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none and hearing none, um, at this time we will go to uh, Jennifer, and I believe it might be Brosseros, uh, and if you can hear me, please state your name, your affiliation, and uh, when people join us electronically, we ask to, them to provide their location and uh, begin your testimony about Title IX. So once again, your name, your affiliation, and your location for the record. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Brasaris. I am the director of uh, Independent Women's Law Center, which is a project of Independent Women's Forum. And I am a former commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and um, a former adjunct professor of law where I taught courses in uh, federal civil rights law generally and Title IX in particular. I'm testifying today um, from the Boston area in Massachusetts. All right. Thank you. If you'd uh, please uh, begin your uh, comments or your testimony on Title IX. Sure. Um, well, as you know, 2022 marks the 50th anniversary of Title IX, a statute that was enacted to end unjust discrimination in federally funded programs and to expand educational opportunities for women and girls. Title IX was not originally sports legislation or exclusively sports legislation. Title IX was and is a simple non-discrimination mandate that prohibits recipients of federal funds from discriminating on the basis of sex. In 1972, the common public understanding of sex was clear. It referred to the two biological categories, male and female, into which human beings generally fall. Title IX's prohibition on sex discrimination therefore prohibited discrimination against somebody because they were a biological woman or a biological man. Um, Title IX was deliberately binary in that it prohibited schools and other recipients of federal funds from implementing policies that favor members of one sex over the other, not as prohibiting all policies that separate or distinguish between males and females on the basis of biological differences. So while Title IX requires schools to treat male and female students equally, the law that was passed in 1972 does not prohibit um, separation of the sexes for certain purposes. So, for example, uh, it was always assumed that schools could provide separate bathrooms, colleges could provide separate dorm rooms, they could provide separate locker rooms. Um, although the statute doesn't discuss sports specifically, Early implementing regulations explain how the statute is to apply to athletic opportunities. Those regulations explicitly allow sex separation for competition. They state that schools may operate single sex athletic teams so long as they provide, quote, equal athletic opportunity for members of both sexes. Um, now, that does not mean that there need to be the exact same opportunities. Um, there do not need to be the exact same sports uh, or teams provided for both sexes, but there has to be an equal number of opportunities for students to participate, both male and female students, to participate in athletics. Um, Title IX's binary framework helps to usher in a period of unprecedented athletic opportunity and achievement for women and girls which I know people have heard a lot about over the past um, several years as we've been approaching this anniversary. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that progress is now at risk. Um, it's at risk from biological men 
competing and entering women's competitions. Um, this is true not only of transgender athletes who identify as female, but also of uh, male athletes generally. Um, so for example, and I mentioned this in my previous testimony um, before the Alaska Senate, um, a number of schools in the 1970s uh, implemented women's field hockey and volleyball teams in order to add opportunities for women and girls that had previously been lacking. And across the United States, there are lots of schools um, that don't offer male volleyball teams or field hockey teams. They offer lots of other sports for men, but don't, don't happen to offer those uh, female dominated sports to male athletes. Well, male athletes have begun to try to seek spots on those teams. Um, this has nothing to do with transgender. This just has to do with sex generally. Um, there are male athletes who are competing and or trying to compete on these teams um, with differing degrees of success depending on the state and, and the circuit in which um, those teams exist. But the principle is is the same as it is with the transgender athlete uh, when these athletes join these varsity teams or these club teams or these college teams they are taking a spot on the roster from a biological female and they are taking away an opportunity um, from a female athlete they are potentially taking playing time potentially a scholarship if we're talking about a d1 sport um, and as we've seen recently with the Leah Thomas example, taking away a chance to win. The fight to protect women's sports is not about transgender politics, as I just said. It's about fairness, but it's also about equal opportunity for women in competitive sport. So with that, I'd like to hand it back um, to the chair and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about um, the legality of this measure about Title IX or about the constitutional limitations. Thank you, Ms. Braceres. I uh, neglected to welcome Senator Machiki to the committee meeting when he joined us about 10 minutes ago. Uh, you do have a question from Senator Machiki. Well, I do. You kind of rushed into politicking for the bill when our questions are specifically related to understanding Title IX. I don't mean that negatively. I'm sure that's how you're geared up to <laughs> kind of respond. but. Back to the basics of Title IX. So essentially, you're saying yeah. it had literally nothing to do with sports, although it identified some um, allowances associated with sports. What was Title IX designed for? And you said <coughs> it was a non-discrimination mandate because obviously there were opportunities that weren't available to females. Mm -hmm. How did it convert into us thinking about Title IX sports. So that's it's kind of all I hear these days is Title IX sports. There are no Title IX sports, apparently. Well, no, there are. It's the Title IX was a very general statute. So it apply it, it prohibits discrimination in all aspects of the educational experience. Um, and sports are a part of that. So while the statute doesn't explicitly mention sports, it clearly covers sports. Um, because it doesn't exempt sports. So any um, entity that receives federal funding has to comply with the non-discrimination mandate in all aspects of its programming, not just the part of its programming that takes those federal funds. So a school can't discriminate on the basis of sex um, in its after-school programming, whether that's sports or um, some other club. Uh, it can't discriminate in terms of academics. It can't, for example, only allow uh, girls to take home ec and boys to take wood shop. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the non-discrimination principle applies to every aspect of programming. Athletics is a little bit different because um, it is physical. It does involve biological differences and therefore the regulation was promulgated to make clear that th that just because the statute forbids discrimination doesn't mean there can't be single sex teams just as there can be single sex bathrooms or dorm rooms or or you know things of that nature so the stat the regulation uh 
was passed to clarify, but the statute itself is all encompassing. Follow up, Senator Michiki. Thank you for that. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to stay off the bill other than trying to get a basic understanding of Title IX. Um, so how have these lawsuits worked out for women's field hockey when they've been challenged or have they been challenged by males that um, just sort of want to play here field hockey and there wasn't a male team available? How have those worked out on a non-discrimination basis uh, to date? Well, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, it depends on the state. So here in Massachusetts, we have a state equal rights amendment, um, which is similar to the federal equal rights amendment that failed in the 1970s. Um, and because of that, the courts have said that um, that sort of overrides Title IX, that constitutional guarantee, that state constitutional guarantee, and the courts have said that, yes, schools have to allow these boys to play on girls' teams. Now, in my own personal experience, uh, I do have daughters who play field hockey. Um, They're out of high school now, but in the last year where my daughter played field hockey in high school, she played against at least three teams that had multiple male athletes on those teams. And those male athletes on those varsity teams did take spots away from girls at their schools who were relegated to the JV team. Um, in other areas, in the Ninth Circuit, for example, you may be familiar with the Clark case uh, where a boy sued to try to get on um, a women's volleyball team, I believe it was in Arizona, um, and the Ninth Circuit correctly held in that case that uh, the boy was not entitled to a spot on the women's team due to Title IX. Uh, follow up. And the only difference is there is Massachusetts had a constitutional ERA and the other, uh, the Ninth Circuit Clark case, that, that was not something that existed. Is that primarily the difference? That's correct, because under equal rights legislation as it's currently crafted in Massachusetts and the way the, the federal bill, the federal amendment was also drafted, um, but thankfully failed, uh, it, it actually would prohibit any sex segregation whatsoever and require full integration of the sexes in every arena, even where biology matters. Um, thankfully, we don't have that at the federal level or in other states, um, so it hasn't impacted women's sports um, in that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Machiki. And I'll just ask, in the Clark case, I believe it was a, a biological boy wanting to compete as a biological male on the girls' volleyball team, correct? That's correct. All right. Senator Stevens. Oh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Um, this is an enormously controversial issue <laughs> that we are faced with. And I really appreciate uh, uh, learning more about uh, uh, Title IX. And, and of course, I think we're all very sympathetic to people who are uh, transitioning and, and try to understand that and try to come to grips with it. But also as a, as a father and a, of girls and a, and, a, and a grandfather of girls, I'm, I really appreciate your comments about uh, taking the space of, uh, that, a, that a girl or young woman could, could take on a team and losing that opportunity. I'd like to ask you a little different question. You did, you did mention it in passing, but it has to do with, uh, uh, well, maybe a little old fashioned, but as a, a father and a grandfather, I'm concerned about the spaces that women have, uh, hospitals, prisons, and uh, changing rooms. Does Title IX address uh, that at all? Well, Title IX addresses the recipients of federal funds. So if an institution, we, we typically think of it as a, a law that covers schools, um, but if you accept federal funding under you know, the auspices of the Department of Education or, or other agencies, um, you are agreeing as a matter of contract to abide by Title IX. Specifically, I was asking about spaces, uh, spaces, changing rooms and that sort of thing. Can you address that? Uh, more specifically, does does Title IX have any impact on on spaces for women uh, in changing rooms in um, hospitals and prisons and that sort of thing? 
I can't speak to that specifically. I might, maybe one of my my colleagues um, who are also testifying today can. What I what I can say is that it has never been um, considered a violation of law, a federal law, to allow private spaces for women or for men uh, on the basis of privacy, safety, or other relevant characteristics. Um, so generally speaking, under constitutional law, as well as under Title IX, um, it is discriminatory when a member of one sex is disfavored um, vis-a-vis a member of the other sex. So as long as an institution is providing bathrooms for both men and women, or changing spaces for both men and women, um, it's not treating members of either sex less favorably, and therefore it is not considered to be discriminating. So, so those policies are generally allowed. Um, uh, you know, Title IX doesn't change that. Um, I have an understanding based on media reports that the Biden administration is about to issue regulations that uh, unfortunately may attempt to change that. Um, I would argue that those regulations aren't necessarily lawful, but that's, but anyway, that's not the current state of play. Senator Stevens? No, I think I've heard enough. I, um, yeah. It, it, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I will go to Senator Begich just because it's oftentimes when they're not physically able to be here, you kind of forget they're out there and there isn't a yellow hand he can raise up or anything since he's joined us by phone. Senator Begich, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, just a couple, if I may. Please proceed. So, yeah, so based on those comments that you just made, um, you're, you're familiar and I'm, I'm taking it you don't agree with the decision and interpretation by the current administration from back in June of 21 about uh, that sex under Title IX equates to gender identity. That, that is the position of the administration today, and I'm, I'm gathering you don't agree with that. Is that correct? Um, sex does not mean the same thing as gender or gender identity. Um, that's clear from, you know, basic common understanding. Um, it's also clear, I believe, as a matter of law. Uh, the Bostock decision did confuse things quite a bit, but that um, applied only to Title VII, which deals with employment discrimination and has nothing to do with Title IX or athletics. I, I'm talking to you, if I may follow up. Senator, Senator Begich. Yeah, the June 16, 2021 Biden administration interpreted sex under Title IX to equate to gender identity. So that is the current state of play. You, you mentioned the state of play earlier. So uh, you, you disagree that that's the current state of play? The Biden administration has interpreted it that way, but they have not issued regulations. So uh, a federal, um, you know, the president cannot, by executive order, just change the meaning of statutes. Um, and frankly, I don't think he can do that by regulation either. But, but in order to um, have the force of law, um, a, a department policy has to go through the notice and comment period and has to be passed as a regulation. That has not happened yet. That is uh, about to happen, we believe, um, but it has not happened yet. And the any guidance or executive order that's come out of this administration is non-binding as a matter of law. I appreciate that. So, did Mr. Chairman, to follow up. Senator Begich. So, I'm just... To, to answer my question, then you disagree with that interpretation of the Biden administration. Is that correct? I do. I both disagree with okay. it um, and uh, assert that it is not binding. Uh, then uh, let me ask uh, one more follow-up question, Mr. Chairman. Senator Begich. You've described uh, complex situations in Arizona and in your own state of Massachusetts, uh, recognizing that different state constitutions may may have different protections that are written within them. And, and so, uh, you know, my, I guess my, my primary question would be, you would, you would agree that there are going to be differences depending on each state's constitutional provisions and how each state interprets the Title IX provisions based on their own state protections in their constitutions. Would that be correct? 
Ms. Praseris? Well, each state may have its own constitutional provisions. Um, Title IX is, you know, applies nationally. Um, it's not about different interpretations of Title IX. It's just about what uh, the conflict that may arise between state law and federal regulations. And Mr. Chairman, what I'm, I guess, I'm getting at here is there are complex constitutional questions here. There are state constitutional questions. There's the question of the statutory provisions federally of Title IX. Clearly, there's a difference uh, between the Ninth Circuit and uh, and the case that was described earlier in Massachusetts because of the differences in the constitutions. And so I'll re re I, I guess maybe one follow-up, if I may, one last follow-up. Please, one last follow-up. And so are you um, are you familiar, fully familiar with the various provisions of Alaska's constitution, constitution in protecting individual rights and privacy and those elements, uh, or are you just, I, I know you hear No, I'm not. I, I have no expertise on Alaska constitutional law. My expertise is on federal civil rights law, both constitutional and statutory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thanks to the witness as well. All right. Thank you, Senator Begich. Thank you, Ms. Braceris. Um, I, at this point, I don't believe there are any further questions from the committee. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Next, I'm going to go to Matt Sharp and Lauren Adams to provide any brief comments on the bill. Uh, Mr. Sharp, if we could start with you, please state your name, any affiliation and your location for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Matt Sharp. I'm senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, and I'm based in our Atlanta, Georgia office. Uh, so I really uh, just wanted to briefly address a, a couple of things with the, the equal protection argument. I know um, my uh, colleague Jennifer touched briefly on that, and it's one of the other arguments we often hear is that uh, a law like this would violate the equal protection clause of the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees everyone receive equal protection under the law. However, the court cases looking this, at that issue, including binding Ninth Circuit precedent, um, have upheld that states can draw distinctions based on sex when they are relevant to the law. Um, and so, for example, there was a, a case at the U.S. Supreme Court over the Virginia Military Institute and the uh, allowing women to enroll in what had then been and traditionally been an all-male institution. And although the court correctly ruled in a decision by Justice Ginsburg that women had to be allowed to enroll, the court still recognized that the Equal Protection Clause would allow things like different housing facilities, uh, as one of the questions brought up by uh, Senator Stevens in the Title IX context, um, and also allow for things like different physical standards for the students attending uh, that may be required to meet. And so based on precedent like that, we've seen other courts, including the Ninth Circuit in the Clark case that uh, Ms. Braceris brought up, upholding policies that specifically say we're going to have separate teams for men and women based on sex because there are physiological differences that are relevant in the sports context. Um, that if, as the Ninth Circuit found, if men were allowed to compete in women's sports because of the differences in, in muscle mass and height and other things that are just uh, rooted in biological sex, um, that men would displace women. And so for that example, the Ninth Circuit looking at it said, this is one of those instances where equal protection allows this because we're, we're recognizing that there are differences. We're still allowing equal opportunities for both sexes, but merely saying that excluding males from the female sports, which is all the Arizona policy in that case did, and all that SB 140 does is say males are not eligible to compete on female teams, that that is fully consistent with the Equal Protection Clause and raises no concerns. Um, one final thing I wanted to hit, going back to the, the question that Senator Stevens asked about Title IX and some of the sex separate spaces, uh, whether we're talking about uh, locker rooms and things like that. Um, just like Title IX and its implementing regulations allow for separate sports programs based on sex, recognizing the differences, it likewise allows for separate uh, toilet, locker room, and shower facilities on the basis of sex. Uh, that's from Regulation 34 CFR 106.33, um, and also allowing for separate housing. So again, this is recognition, just like uh, Ms. Becerra's was talking about, that Title IX it was, was, as was written um, specifically intended to allow laws and policies like SB 140 to allow states to say we want to preserve separate opportunities for females uh, in sports and in other areas as well. 
Um, so with that, I'd, uh, again, be happy to answer any additional questions that the committee has. Um, if not, then uh, obviously we'd hand it over to my uh, colleague, Lauren Adams. At this time, I'll look at the committee and see if there are any questions. I don't see any here. Senator Begich, do you have any questions? No questions. All right. Thank you, Senator Begich. Uh, so next up would be Lauren Adams. And if you could state your name and your affiliation and your location for the record and begin your testimony. Hi, um, yes, my name is Lauren Adams. I am the legal director of Women's Liberation Front, also called WOLF. Uh, we're the nation's largest radical feminist, nonpartisan, nonprofit agency, and I'm actually in Madison, Wisconsin. All right, please proceed. Okay. WOLF has over a thousand members across the U.S., including in the state of Alaska, many of whom um, play sports. Uh, other states have already passed similar laws that we've discussed. Um, I wanted to highlight the bipartisan support in many of the other legislatures. Um, there have been nine states that have had bipartisan support in passing these bills. We have done national and statewide polling in both uh, you know, red and blue states, which suggests that policies like this are supported by a majority of voters across the political spectrum including liberal voters like myself and many other WOLF members. Um, not that you would know this from kind of watching the national discourse around it, but the public does know that having only co-ed sports is not fair. This is something that we understand um, implicitly. Um, sex separated sports exist and are permitted under Title IX because of these sex differences that are highly relevant to athletics we don't separate we only separate sports by sex because of those physiological differences we don't separate sports by race or ethnicity by sexual orientation religion or anything else or any other facet of a person's identity and so gender identity and how a person feels about their sex should not be um you know a factor in what's what team they're eligible to play on and you know our, my organization uh promotes you know feminist values and it is deeply offensive to say that a female athlete's place on a girl's soccer team um, is contingent on how much she expresses femininity um, and to say that a male athlete who might embrace femininity and reject masculinity does not belong on a, on a men's or a boy's team um, that's not really very inclusive to us and we think that there should be more focus on ensuring that male athletes are safe and welcome on teams that are open to their sex instead of asking female athletes to give up limited spaces available to them. And that's really the violation of the Equal Protection Clause that we see, which is the status quo under you know Biden's guidance is that there are single sex teams that they're men's teams um, and then there's co-ed teams. And so women and girls are being deprived where these policies are enacted of single sex sports opportunities. Um, so I think that's really important to just visualize. And when, when these athletes are forced to compete on these co-ed teams, they do are deprived of, of scholarships, medals, records, et cetera. And I know that there's a lot of focus on American examples and, you know, Leah Thomas has been in the news and there's been Connecticut, Idaho and these other, other areas, but one of the most striking examples to me is actually in Iran, where you know homosexuality is condemned by death, but uh, sex changes are state-sponsored, and eight members of their national women's soccer team are biological males. So that's eight female athletes who in Iran, who were, which is not rife with you know opportunities of any kind for women, who don't have spaces on that women's team. So I, you know, I think that. It may seem absurd, but that's a that's a large number, and I think there's a lot of focus in this debate that ends up um, looking at oh well, it's not that many, right? It's not there's only a couple here and there. We're only hearing, but I, you know, there's been a number of recent high quality polls, including Gallup, that suggest that up to 20% of young people who would be fall into these regulations, K-12 and college, identify as transgender, non-binary, or some other identity. It's very much a feature of this current generation of, um, you know, wanting to branch out and not be stuck in one kind of label. And that's that's just very much the culture of, of this generation. And so 
I think that making any decisions based on the assumption that this is a, a small group of people is really a huge mistake. And as we've seen several times in recent years, even just a single male athlete can displace dozens of women or girls by taking top, you know, top spots by winning first and second over and over. And each time that happens, that's an opportunity lost by a female athlete. And, uh, you know, we just don't believe, it's not our experience that, um, that you can just ask women to, to give these things up. And that's, that's just not fair. So um, I, I thank you for the opportunity to testify and I welcome any questions that you have. All right, thank you, Ms. Adams. Are there any questions from committee members? Senator Machiki? Oh. Yeah, I, I can wait uh, if whatever you choose or I can. Uh, Senator Begich. Just a, a quick question to the witness. Are, are you aware that uh, our Alaska Athletic Association has on the record and in the press indicated that there is no instance that, that they are aware of where a person in Alaska has been denied a place on a spot for a scholarship or for any other uh, element on the sports team because of transgender sports? I'm not aware of that, but I've heard similar arguments in other places. And I guess my response to that would be, uh, if that's seen as a good thing, that there's been no displacement, then what's wrong with putting into law that that should be the case? And if the argument is that that's not a good thing, because it means that maybe there's not uh, athletic opportunities being realized, I guess, for, for some of these transgender athletes, then, you know, that's the debate to have. But as as Jennifer noted, these this guidance from Biden's Department of Education and possible upcoming rulemaking is likely going to make it um, unavoidable that this will happen if it has not already. Uh, Follow up, Senator Begich. Yeah, just I guess uh, I guess the reason why would be because it's not constitutional in the state of Alaska. But that notwithstanding, you mentioned two things. You mentioned a Gallup poll, and you mentioned uh, evidence about um, the Iranian soccer team. Could you please provide that data to the committee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Baggage. Senator Machiki. Yeah, Ms. Adams, why do you uh, you use the term radical female liberation? Um, organization how do you use that definition what is what makes you radical <laughs> so actually radical in this context and radical feminism which is really an offshoot of second wave feminism the term radical in that context refers to root so looking at root feminism and we see we examine the oppression of women and girls as being sex-based so it's on the basis of um, you know, the desire to exploit um, our reproductive, domestic, and sexual labor. So that's why our, our group, we oppose policies that um, take away women-only spaces and teams and things like that. But we also work against commercial sexual and reproductive exploitation in terms of the multi-billion dollar pornography business and commercial surrogacy and other forms of male violence we fight for the rights of um, lesbian and bisexual women who are disproportionately harmed by policies that um, allow, you know, males into female only spaces. So radical in that sense doesn't mean fringe or extreme. It means basically uh, getting back to basics and focusing on really the root cause of what is, why are women discriminated against in this country, in our culture? why are they exploited in these different ways and the reason is is because we are different than men physiologically and biologically and it is those features that are that cause that discrimination that's why pregnancy discrimination is a form of sex discrimination because only women can get pregnant and only women can have babies um and so we have a culture and you know this is what our laws fight against that says well so, so we look at it as women can get pregnant and therefore we need to protect women against discrimination on that basis. And our culture says, well, women can get pregnant, so women are the moms and they're the ones who should, who should you know, take the hit on their careers or should do these other things. So it's fighting against those things. Um, and I would also add to that that 
when we start to take the position that, you know, some men get pregnant or some, you know, things like that, we are actually putting at risk existing laws which state that such things are considered sex discrimination because how can it be sex discrimination if people who get pregnant um, can identify as either either sex. So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question about, I guess, the definition of radical feminism and what that means to us, but it's, it's very just woman focused and we define that biologically because that's the basis of our oppression. Okay, we've got a couple more, if, you, if I may. Senator Machiki. You, uh, your organization talks about gender abolition. Um, what does that mean, and how does that fit into this? So if, if uh, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the term, um, but you facilitate a cultural shift away from gender roles and sex stereotypes. How does that dovetail into this particular issue? Because sex, you know, as is traditionally defined is even if you look at the World Health Organization or even our own National Institute of Health, sex is defined by biology. And a lot of times we see gender, you'll hear people say gender is a social construct. And that means that any social, any society, including ours, creates gendered roles. And that's kind of what I was getting at where you have the biological roles, which is what reproductive role you play if you if you choose to and are able to reproduce. But then the other piece of it is what we've, the expectations of behavior, dress, hair, um, what avenues in life are open to you in employment and education, that's gender. That is what our society has created and said, this is what a woman is. Where that dovetails into this and why, why gender identity policies in general are an issue um, for our organization is that a gender identity, which is you know, people usually define it as your self-identity as like male, female or something else because we have like non-binary. Um, we find that deeply regressive to say that that's something you can identify as because what are you identifying as? You can't identify as a person with a different type of body because that doesn't make sense. So you're identifying with um, the social role and we believe that that social role that's been prescribed for women in this country and in Iran and in all these other places is one that is subordinate and that's what we fight against. So placing these protections in law when the entire reason we have women's only spaces is to um, protect us from violence, to protect our access to public life and our ability to use these places in public that's why women can go, you know, 100 years ago, they were fighting for women's public bathrooms so that women could get away from the house and be able to go and go places and not have to come home and be stuck in the home in the domestic sphere. And so it really feels like we're going backwards in that way. And the other reason why this is an issue for us is because, um, as I mentioned, uh, um, we have a huge membership that is um, lesbian and bisexual women and that is, an, is a demographic that has been very much harmed by some of these policies. You have even under Title IX, you'll have LGBT campus centers who are telling young girls, 18, 19, 20 years old, that, you know, they need to sort of uh, accept opposite sex partners because it's same gender attraction, not same sex attraction. So you end up having this basically a heteronormative culture that's being imposed upon these girls who are just beginning to accept themselves and be accepted for their for their sexual orientations and it just feels very regressive and going backwards and you're having women go back in the closet because they don't want to admit that they won't accept biological males as partners and feel that they need to qualify that as as a you know as a boundary for them when they don't. So that's kind of how this all slides in together. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Bichicki, Senator Stevens, nothing? Yeah, all right. Sure, yes, I do have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Stevens, I thought you were waving me off. No, no thank okay. you, Chairman. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Ms. Adams, I appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, uh, we're always learning so much uh, here in the legislature uh, about what's going on in the world. I guess the most shocking thing I heard you say, um, if I have this right, I think you said that one out of every five 
young people in this country identify as transgender. One of every five, actually, I think you said 20% of young people identify as transgender. Um, that it's a, a generational thing. Uh, so hard for us to understand from not from this younger generation. So uh, I'd like some. I'd like to know more about that. I'd like you to um, provide us some information. Um, is that really true? It's you know, I, all I can do is know from my own experience and the young people that I know that doesn't appear to be true. One of every five. But could um, could you give well, us some more facts on that and and provide some information that we can actually look at? Sure, I can absolutely send what I have um, when the hearing is done. I don't know how to do it while I'm in the in the meeting itself. Um, but I think uh, it's not that they all identify as as that group as transgender. It's that you know this concept of cisgender, where you know a person identifies as the sex they are. It's it's that only eighty percent identify as that. So you have like this non-binary or I'm gender queer or I'm gender fluid and these other sort of identities and that that are fluid and you have already have people, I think it's worth looking into information on detransitioning and desisting. There is a large population of people, especially young people who identify as transgender for a period of time and then don't later on. Um, and it's not necessarily this fixed identity. A lot of advocates of these policies will have you focus on the small population of young kids who tend to have more persistent identities in this way. Um, and that is not the majority of this. I think there's an experimentation and it comes from a good place. It actually comes from, you know, you, you have, just for example, you have these boys who say, you know, I don't want to be stuck in this masculine pigeonhole and I'm not allowed to do this or that, and they're experimenting with it. And likewise, you have girls doing the same thing. They're saying, I don't want to be limited by my sex. I want it to be, you know, not, not to be something that defines me in life. And so then they go out in the world and you have people telling them, yeah, but if you don't identify as female, if that doesn't feel correct to you, then you are either transgender or you're non-binary. So we're giving this message to people who don't, who want to reject sex stereotypes that your sex is defined by stereotypes and we're medicalizing these kids. And I also think that that's an important note for these types of policies is you end up having well-meaning people who want to compromise and say, well, maybe if they've transitioned young, right? Like they took puberty blockers and they started on hormones. That is no kind of solution for something that for many people is a temporary identity. Most of the high quality studies that are done, and I can send these along as well, have shown up to an 80 to 90% desistance rate for young people in long-term follow-up. And the most likely outcome is not that they identify as transgender 10 years later, it's that they identify as a gay or bisexual adult. So what we're also seeing is essentially medicalization that leads to irreversible changes in fertility and sexual function for a group that is largely LGB. And we need to be keeping that in mind that it's many of us on the left who are seeing this and disagree with it, believe it is a form of conversion therapy, especially when you have, um, you know, there's a, there's a young person, Kai Shapley, who has been trotted out by the ACLU a lot and gone around and testified in many states of these bills. If you read the story of this child this family who was very conservative was terrified that their three-year-old was going to grow up to be gay because he wanted to play with dolls, he wanted to wear dresses and they didn't like it. And they beat this child every time he wanted to do these things and they would spank him and they looked up homemade, homemade conversion therapy and things like that. And then finally they have this epiphany that actually, oh, Kai is actually a girl. So they start, you know, the beatings stop and it's because their child went to them and said that he wanted to go meet Jesus. You know, their toddler expressed that they wanted to die. That's a more extreme version, but it's being celebrated as this, this family finding this really progressive way of thinking when really they're just not accepting their child. And that's why we see it in Iran too. We see, you know, you're not a lot. If you are a man who wants to have a sexual relationship with a man, then they consider you a degenerate or a pervert. But if you are a biological male who wants the same thing, but you identify as a woman, then you're accepted in society and they will help that happen. But you have to fit into their box. 
And so you still have this system where you have these boxes and we're reinforcing them. The follow up. Uh, Chairman. Follow up. I'll just remind the committee we do have about six amendments we're going to try to get through today. Okay. But uh, uh, Senator Stevens. Well, I, I know we're getting into the weeds here, and that's okay. But uh, yet you did say up to 20% of young people identify as transgender. Uh, and I just need to have that proven a little bit. If that's a statement you still stand by, then, then show me. I'd, I'd like to see the proof of that. I, I think we deserve more than just uh, that blanket comment. I think we deserve uh, some, uh, um, some information that shows that to be the case. Thank you. And Ms. Adams, I'll, I'll state that I, I, I've heard the same statistics she's heard, that 80% um, identify as male or female, and there's 20% that do identify as some of the other uh, gender identities that are allowed, but um, if, if she has uh, documentation, if she could provide it to this committee, that'd be appreciated. Yes, and I will send it along, but I, what I said was identify as transgender, non-binary, or another identity similar to that, because that does include those who identify as non-binary or gender fluid or things like that. Um, and typically uh, the same act, the same, you know, um, advocates who promote being able to self-identify onto like sports teams will also um you know want people who identify as non-binary to be able to do the same thing so it's still covered under the same um idea with the advocacy but i will absolutely send along what i have all right thank you miss adams i'll also mention senator baggage made the comment about um this being unconstitutional i tell you i i look at title nine have a copy of it right here in front of me i see title nine talks in terms of both sexes it doesn't talk in terms of numerous gender identities. And if the federal government feels they need to revisit Title IX, um, I believe that might be a way forward for the federal government. But I do believe that uh, the intent of Senate Bill uh, 140 is uh, in compliance with Title IX as written. Mr. Senator Baggage. Yes, I mean, since you mentioned that, um, I meant in terms of Alaska's constitution in particular, which has stronger uh, it has some stronger protections, especially when it uh, comes to rights of privacy and equal protection. Thank you, Senator Baggage. Senator Hughes? Um, I'm wondering if perhaps, um, because I had a long discussion with uh, Mr. Sharp on, on that, those issues and talking with him about our Constitution in that way, if he could maybe speak to um, why this, this is not... Uh, infringement of privacy rights or equal protection if if you'd give them the opportunity to, to mr sharp record. did you hear the question i did mr chairman thank you um so yeah let me let me address those separately i think the the equal protection um aspect of it again my i have, have not done a full survey but my understanding is that um Alaska sort of mirrors how the, the federal courts have interpreted equal protection and what that involves. And so my previous discussion of how the federal courts have interpreted the federal equal protection clause, um, I think holds true. And again, I'm, I'm not familiar with anything in Alaska uh, by the Alaska Supreme Court interpreting it that would be any different than that. On the privacy point, I, I did do some, some pretty in-depth research on the privacy clause in the Alaska Constitution and, and do understand that it has a, a broad reading um, of this idea that uh, private information that an individual would not want to be publicly disclosed, that there's protection against that. Um, however, this bill would not do any of that. It would not require, permit, allow any public disclosure uh, of any information about a student. Rather, this would all be done very privately. Um, just as currently as the case, any student wanting to participate in sports, there's going to be certain eligibility determinations. Um, so if you're at the collegiate level, there's there's questions about how old are you? How long have you been competing? Have you um, exceeded the years of eligibility? Um, and when we're talking about in high school, there's often issues of are you within the correct geographic district? Do you live in the right area to, to be enrolled in the school here and to play on these sports? Um, have you aged out of being able to compete in sports? Um, are you of the appropriate weight class if you're dealing with uh, certain sports like wrestling? And this would be one of those many eligibility requirements saying if you're a biological male, um, you're not eligible to compete on female teams. And just like in any of those other eligibility determinations, it, it's a private conversation and the, the school, again, my understanding is would quietly let the student know you're not eligible to compete on this particular team or in this particular sport. It would be operating the same way here. 
nothing would be disclosed. There wouldn't be a list or any private information about a student publicly disclosed. Um, it would obviously, the student always has the prerogative if they wanted to raise awareness or, or complain about it. But the school itself, all of this would be done in the exact same manner that they determine student eligibility for uh, other sports based on other characteristics, age, weight, et cetera. Um, so again, nothing in this would require, permit, authorize the disclosure of private information about the students in violation of the privacy clause of the Alaska Constitution. Mr. Chairman. Senator Baggage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, in terms of the uh, Equal Protection Clause, our Supreme Court has opined on that in a number of different instances and specifically stated that it's stronger than, and in fact, it was designed to be stronger than the equal protection provided by the federal constitution. Second, I appreciate your comments as a, as a witness. You're not barred in the state of Alaska and have not made these arguments before the Supreme Court or before our courts. Our legal advice here says the opposite and does not concur with the opinion you've just offered. So I think, Mr. Chairman, this begs the question as to whether or not we should truly refer this bill to the Judiciary Committee so that we can have a true and robust discussion of the legal matters that are clearly evident in this bill. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Begich. Senator Machiki. General comment, yeah. this is a very strange bedfellow bill when you think about the folks, so you think about um, this particular concern as being sort of a conservative concern, but we have Wolf on the line here, who's you know clearly um, unabashedly pro-choice um, and has some very, um, well, they, they use the term radical in their approach, which I don't think is particularly radical, but um, they like that identity teamed up with some very conservative folks on this issue. Just wondering what um, um, Ms. Ms. Adams feels. feels. We've got some, got some feedback here. Feedback here. One second. One second. All right, try it now. Okay, okay much better. So just wondering what Ms. Adams feels with, with what I kind of just stated on sort of the intersex condition, which is just one of my concerns with um, this bill. And I, I will absolutely support the fact that biological males should not be competing against biological females in, I call them Title IX sports. I, I think that's probably not the proper term at this point from what we understand about Title IX. What about those folks that are biologically, physiologically not clearly, and I understand it's extremely rare, but it does occur. How does Wolf view that situation when we think about female sports? So for starters, I think it needs to start with not conflating that issue with the other issue because one of them you know again sports is based on bodies and physical abilities and so you have one thing that's a personal identity and one thing that is um you know different afflictions or not afflictions but variations in in development that affect they're all sex specific so i think the the medical aspect of what you're asking about I don't have a good answer for but like you said it's very rare um, but it is very clear that um, every single possible thing that can happen every single disorder of sexual development is sex specific it's based on um, whether you're male or female and all of them are different so I you know different disorders that were mentioned as maybe having more masculine appearances um, versus more feminine appearances, by the time we get up to puberty, that is very apparent. And my heart goes out to them. And I think it's so rare that the most appropriate thing to me would seem to be that schools would be able to have the flexibility or districts to deal with that on a case by case basis when it comes up. Um, and I'm not sure if the, the Alaska Association that, um, was mentioned earlier, which wasn't aware of any um, sort of trans dominance in, in the field, is aware of 
uh, incidences of discrimination or hardship for athletes who have disorders of sexual development. But I think that, um, you know, people in that situation need a lot of compassion and there needs to be sort of a curated solution that I doubt needs to be handled at the state legislative level. But that would just be my response to that. I'm not. Yeah, but I, it's a very I'm separate checking. issue. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Maybe a question for Matt. So I'm, I don't know if ADA covers. So that's my, my essentially primary concern with this bill. You, if you have young people that are struggling, um, it should not be life defining if it's a medical irregularity. I shouldn't say regularity. Um, I, I, I think you know what I mean. Is that covered by ADA? Does that um, does that allow, and I know we have one amendment here trying to kind of deal with that. Does that deal with Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or something else that would allow a solution under this bill? I, I want those young people to belong. I want them to find a way to be successful. I'm, I'm most concerned about them. And I understand, first of all, we don't have a single case of there that I know of in Alaska right now where we have a trans trying to be in a uh, primarily female sport. So we're writing a bill to get ahead of this in case it becomes an issue in the future. When we do that, we need to consider all of the issues. This is a potential issue. Mr. Sharp, how would you see a system working and possibly this amendment that we have coming up? I guess we can discuss it during that period of time, but and you've been dealing with this for a little while. How are states making sure that those young people that are um, where there's not a clear um, male-female delineation, how do we keep them included and feeling like they belong and uh, successful? Mr. Sharp? Yes. Uh, thank you. And that's, I think that's a, a very uh, great question and one that I completely agree with. We do want to make sure that any student born with an intersex condition or uh, other situation like that is fully protected. And fortunately, um, as you alluded to, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, specifically covers those individuals. Uh, and so the citation is, uh, apologize, let me bring this up. It is 42 USC uh, 12211, and it's part of the definition sections of, of what's included. Uh, and it specifically includes a gender identity, excuse me, gender identity disorder uh, that is based on a physical impairment. So that's something where we're not talking about someone just self-identifying, but where there's actually a chromosomal issue or some other uh, developmental issue where in the womb, perhaps um, the, the uh, chemicals and triggers, uh, you know, did not work out right. And so that you've got an individual with uh, ambiguous reproductive anatomy or, or something along those lines, they are fully protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And because through various federal laws that do apply that to schools and colleges, any student with such a condition would be entitled to full accommodations. And so just like that student has that individualized education plan that goes into things like classroom and access to various activities, uh, their ability and access to sports would be governed by that as well. So nothing in this act could or would in any way interfere with that. And so any student that has a you know medically diagnosed intersex condition would receive those full protections and it would be um, as uh, it was sort of brought up, the, the school and the parents involved with that student working together and accommodating them. And so that would include allowing them to play sports uh, consistent with how their doctors and everyone um, believes is the best fit for them. And so we do want them to have full protections and fortunately federal law fully addresses that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator Wojcicki. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Um, at this point, uh, having exhausted questions from the committee, uh, Senator Hughes, did you want to come back up to the uh, uh, committee table and you'll keep Mr. Phelps on board for helping with the amendments? All right, so now we will move to amendments. Uh, amendment number one by Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and move amendment number one. Um, I will object for discussion. Would you care to explain your amendment or would you, or will Daniel be? Um, I'll let Daniel and then I'll follow up. Thank you, Mr. Please Chair. Please put yourself on the record. 
Sure. Uh, this is Daniel Phelps, staff to Senator Hughes, and through the chair, uh, looking at amendment number one, document number A.9. Um, although the page 14 of the drafting manual typically advises, advises against statements of purpose, um, in the case of this specific legislation, it was determined that intent is helpful in responding to some of the constitutional challenges raised against the bill. Um, and to this end, Amendment A.9 would provide explicit legislative intent, indicating that the goal of the legislation is, in fact, fairness and athletic opportunities for women and girls. All right. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. Is there, are there any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Chairman? Senator Begich? Um, I object to this amendment, and uh, we just, on two, on two grounds. First, um, the Johnny Ellis dictum of, of not necessarily adding to a bill that I'm not necessarily going to be supportive of. But second, and more importantly, legislative findings and intent are findings of fact. And this, you know, under number one and under number three in this particular bill, I'm concerned that we're de demonstrating as fact that there has been a demonstrated unfairness in athletic opportunity, which uh, clearly isn't the case. And secondarily, that uh, it, we're assigning or specifically defining how different sexes are it doesn't acknowledge that women in fact uh, are clearly have greater endurance when it comes to some sports like the Iditarod where they consistently championed men so there's there's questions about these let this this intent the these findings and intent and whether they are in fact factual so with that I'm going to be opposing this amendment mr. chair Senator Hughes so um I, I will note for the record that each of these things were um, covered and we, we gave, uh, used research and, and factual information in the first hearing. Um, so all of these things have been backed up with that. Yes, there are always e exceptions um, to these, but these were, were based on research and presented in the first hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hughes. I, I, I'll also agree that I appreciated the article that uh, was submitted uh, transgender women in the female category sport perspectives on testosterone sup suppression and performance advantage does have uh, quite a few indications. One of the indications, and there was even after a study showed even after eight years of hormone therapy, um, there was still an, an advantage of transgender females over females based on their biological male uh, beginnings. But um, all right, uh, with that being said, is there any other discussion on this amendment? There is an objection to this amendment. So, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Senator Yes. Senator Hughes? Yes. Senator Yes. Senator No. Senator Hall? Yes. With a vote of four yeas and one nays, amendment number one, labeled A.9, is adopted. Amendment number two is by Senator Hughes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move amendment number two. I will object for discussion. Mr. Phelps? Yes, uh, Daniel Phelps, uh, staff to Senator Hughes. Through the chair, document number A.6, amendment number two, provides a definition to biological sex. Is there any comment or discussion on amendment number two? Senator Michiki. So I, I see where you're going with this. How, what if the determination, depending on where the birth took place, was incorrect at the time? And as the child develops, it's clearly the child is clearly a gender other than what was claimed on the birth certificate. How would that be alleviated if you have a very obvious male that had a female birth certificate? Isn't this kind of locking in a potential unfair competition from the male later on in life? Senator Hughes? Yeah, it's a very good question and um, the uh, Americans with Disability Act actually, and Matt can speak to this, would still accommodate that student. And I believe actually that um, the 
a birth certificate, Matt can correct me if I'm wrong, can actually be corrected because sometimes visually um, at the time it may not um, be what actually develops. So there is accommodation. If we could let Ms. Mr. Sharp speak to that, Mr. Chair. Mr. Sharp, did you hear the question? I did, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, as Senator Hughes said, so uh, I think in that particular scenario, that probably would be an individual that has a uh, intersex condition or disorder of sexual development that would be covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So they would be included and, and the, their eligibility would be determined by that uh, individualized education plan or, or other accommodation necessary. Outside of that, though, I would emphasize my, my understanding of this amendment. It's meant to be a, a default rule uh, to give something school officials can very quickly rely on. As Senator Hughes mentioned, schools are already collecting birth certificates as part of the enrollment. And so they're able to rely on that. Um, it's only in circumstances where that's unreliable. So for example, maybe you've got a student that um, immigrated from another country and they didn't have a birth certificate or uh, a situation where a uh, birth certificate has been amended and there's concerns about that. Nothing would preclude schools from being able to ask for additional evidence. So again, the, the school could say something like, um, because you're missing a birth certificate, can you provide a, a statement from your personal physician verifying your sex? Something to give schools other things that they can look at. But what this is really meant to do is provide sort of a default rule that schools can rely upon so that rather than having to do something new, they can just continue to rely upon those birth certificates that they were collecting when the student originally enrolled in the school. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Quick follow up. Follow up from Senator Machiki. So the, the Mr. Sharp, my question is because it says that if it was designated at or near the time of participants birth on the birth certificate issue, which may be incorrect for hypothetically any number of reasons. You're saying that there's a method in this bill that allows other options for ASAA or the district or the school to evaluate using other methods because that is the definition um, based on the participants biological sex as either male or female blah 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 but <laughs> this doesn't lock you in to the the birth at the time of birth birth certificate um, identification of that individual as either a male or female one moment, Mr. Sharp, Senator Hughes. I just want to point uh, in the amendment on line three, it says may be relied on. So that does um, uh, allow um, a physician statement, et cetera, to be used as well in the circumstances you described. Yeah, I see. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Begich, was that, I wasn't looking, was that yeah. Senator Begich? Yeah, just um, I, I, I think the question is that Senator Machiki's asked may be my question as well. And I don't believe that that may is meant in that context. Did, we, did you get legal advice on this particular, uh, Senator Hughes, did you get legal advice on this particular amendment today? Sp advice that addresses the question that Senator Machiki has asked, which is my question as well. Senator Hughes. Uh, well, Ledge Legal drafted it, and maybe we could ask my staff specifically, um, Daniel. Mr. Phelps. Sure. Uh, Daniel Phelps, staff to Senator Hughes through the chair. Um, we, uh, Ledge Legal did draft this, um, this amendment. We also had input from outside counsel available today. Um, and the, the intent behind the may is, was indeed that it was a may, not a shall. So, uh, the birth certificate may be relied upon uh, providing for you know another potential document or determination if there was a specific situation that merited that all right thank you mr phelps follow up follow up from senator begich mr chairman is there anybody on from ledge legal who could perhaps answer my question as opposed to yeah i mean my question is would given the question Senator Machiki asked, would this prohibit somebody whose birth certificate was in error from being able to participate, which is my reason for opposing the amendment. So is there somebody from Ledge Legal online? No one is available from Ledge Legal at this time. Okay. 
Right. Senator Hughes. You know, n knowing that that conversation took place with, with the drafter, and as I read it, um, I and perhaps one of um, the legal experts online can look at that, may be relied on, and speak to it, but I'm, I'm confident it it would allow and address the concern that Senator Machiki brought up. And my, my, Baggage's my plain out. reading as a non-attorney would agree with that. May is not but, must, but, it's not shall. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me let me offer a different interpretation, if I may. Senator Begich. I, I read this as saying the birth certificate may be relied on if the sex designated on the birth certificate was designated at or near the time of the participant's birth, meaning it, could, it wouldn't be relied on if it came later. That's the way I read this amendment, and that's why I think it's ambiguous. Thank you, Senator Beggert. Senator Machiki? Well, I'm willing to ask Mr. Sharp about that because that was the, the exact question that I had at the beginning of this discussion. So it, it seems to only allow the birth certificate. It doesn't seem like a birth certificate could be created. So you could be locking a biological male in at the issuance of a birth certificate that may actually be or a biological female, I'm not going to pick a gender here, locking them in and that at birth issuance, which may be incorrect. We live in a place that um, has less conventional medical care available the further you get away from <laughs> urban Alaska in many cases. And, and do, is there an option if there is a correction later? And I know this is, again, going to be a rare case, it's hypothetical, but um, the may and the if are related. Is, in, in your opinion, is there another option? So they don't have to rely on the birth certificate at all. They, they may use the birth certificate, um, but they can't use a new birth certificate in accordance with this amendment, if you in fact realize that that female is actually a male later on, which is what we're trying to protect against, what do you assume is the solution in that particular case? And does this amendment worry you on um, being able to make a later adjustment that actually determines that this is a biological male that should not be competing in female sports? Uh, so no, the, the amendment does not concern me. Um, and so let me explain why. So number one, again, I, I would first go back to if a student had a diagnosed intersex condition, something where they were uh, mis, mis given the wrong sex at birth and then through uh, medical uh, you know, testing or something like that, it was determined, no, you were actually assigned the wrong test uh, sex at birth. That would all be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so that would trump anything in this state law and, and their eligibility would be determined by that. What this is that 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 question of why are we tying it to at or near birth? Uh, because several states do allow uh, an individual to change their birth certificate to reflect their gender identity without any uh, medical diagnosis or anything like that. In fact, that, that has happened in some of the cases that we've been involved in where males have been allowed to compete. And they point to say, well, my, my birth certificate says I'm a female, therefore you must allow me to play. I think what this is targeted at is saying, we don't want someone that in their you know, 12, 13, 14 years old uh, goes and gets their birth certificate amended and gets it changed to reflect their gender identity and them then saying now you must allow me to compete on the female team even though i'm biologically a female so what this tells schools is you already have the birth certificate you can rely on that as long as the sex listed on there was written at or issued at or near the time of the participant's birth so when they were born if that is not true if it has changed at a later date um, whether through the student in an amendment or through uh, you know, a uh, medical testing or something like that, it would just tell the school, you can't rely on the birth certificate then, you need to, at that circumstance, you could solicit other evidence. So a signed affidavit from a physician or other evidence that the student submits to verify their sex. And it ultimately boils down to that, that first sentence, which is what is the definition of sex? It's either male or female based on sex at birth. Um, and so I think what this was intended to do was to give schools clear direction of you can't rely on the birth certificates unless 
that sex listed on there has been changed at a latter date. And then at that point, you uh, should need to consider other evidence to verify the student's sex. And we wanted to give schools some flexibility. Some of them have a sports physical that a physician would sign off on that would list the student's sex. They could rely on that. Um, could be other evidence. Obviously, if it's a student with a diagnosed uh, disability covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, that would trump that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. With, is there any further discussion on amendment number two? With no further. I, I do have a comment just as a background that might be helpful. Um, my understanding, and I don't have verification, Ledge Legal is not online, but um, there is some ability to amend birth certificates even in our state. And that is one reason why we wanted the adder near just for clarification. But I'm, I'm very glad you've brought up the, the situation, you know, these, these um, important but rare incidences and that we certainly will have a way to accommodate those students. So um, I just want to get on the record that there is some ability to amend birth certificates in our state. All right. Thank you, Senator Hughes. With no further discussion, I will remove my objection. Is there further objection? I object. Senator Baggett objects uh, at this point. Yeah. M Madam Secretary, oh, do you care to speak to your objection? I, th I, I do, just to, just to say that um, once again, this is a question that's created, in my mind anyway, legal ambiguity, and I think really speaks to why this bill needs a judiciary referral. Thank you, Senator Baggett. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Yes. 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 No. Yes. Yes. With four yeas and one nay, amendment number two, label A.6 is adopted. At this point, amendment number three, Thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move amendment number three. I will object for discussion. Daniel Phelps, Mr. Phelps. staff to Senator Hughes for the record. Um, looking at document number A.12, uh, amendment A.12 provides clarifying language to section 1418.160. The intent of the section was to reduce the burden and expense for schools and school districts when it comes to processing complaints against the school or school district for complying with the law. The sponsor and other members expressed a desire to allow school districts to make their own choices about responding to complaints for compliance with the law. This amendment would remove the restriction on consideration of such complaints and opening an investigation um, from an, a complaint arising from this legislation. In place, the bill grants the power for a school or school district to decline to consider a complaint against them for complying with the law. Further clarifying language indicates that nothing in this section abrogates, restricts, or limits a person's access to the courts or their right to bring a cause of action arising out of this section. All right. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. Is there any uh, discussion on amendment number three? Mr. Chairman. Senator Baggage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, say I'm not certain that this particular amendment does resolve the issue that was brought up in the legal memo I provided to the committee. With that, I just want to put that on the record that it probably deserves a re review by our department, our legal affairs department. And with that, uh, I have no other comment. All right. Thank you, Senator Begich. Uh, so uh, I'll just make a Senator comment. Hughes. Um, and in discussion with our alleged legal department, we actually did want to ensure that we weren't infringing on due process rights and this and that was our request as part of the drafting of this amendment so i am confident that it does address um, the question brought up i appreciate the sponsor's uh, uh, action on this amendment in particular um, i will be in support of this amendment but uh, i will withdraw my objection is there further objection senator baggage did, I had, don't had, have you do not have an objection? I know I've stated that I, I'm going to get a legal opinion on it. I have no objection at this time. All right. Thank you, Senator Baggage. With no further objection, amendment number three, labeled A.12, is adopted. Up next is amendment number four by Senator Hughes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move amendment number four. I will reject for discussion. Mr. Phelps. Sure. Daniel Phelps, staff to Senator Hughes to the chair. Um, the sponsor in conversation with other members agreed that the state should not be prescribing causes of action to the people. So uh, amendment A.3 would remove, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, amendment A.3. Four. I'm sorry. Amendment number four, A.3. There you go. Amendment four, A.3. Uh, I'm sorry, through the chair. Um, this amendment, amendment uh, deals with access to the courts and it makes a similar statement to that of the previous amendment, uh, except a blanket application to the whole bill that nothing in the bill would prevent a person's access to state or federal court or a person's right to bring to a state or federal court a complaint or cause of action arising out of this bill. All right, is there any further discussion on amendment number four? Hearing no further discussion, I will with withdraw, withdraw my objection. Is there further objection? Hearing no objection, amendment number four, labeled A.3, is adopted. Next up will be amendment number five by Senator Hughes. I, uh, <laughs> amendment number five by Senator Hughes. Yeah, um, actually. I, I believe, uh, um, Mr. Chair, that Senator Michiki, this, this was an amendment um, uh, that he would like to see, so he's. I believe he's going to. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I move amendment number five by Senator Hughes and Machiki, and I can speak to it if there's objection. Uh, I will object for discussion. So I, this amendment simply is I, I had a really hard time. We spent a lot of time in the courtroom, and that's appropriate. We're dealing with law, and we're a separate branch of government from the judicial branch. But I found it... Um, interesting that we were suggest so we're already giving them standing in the three sections um in, in the liability section we're giving those who may feel that there's an issue uh standing i felt that we were going too far by suggesting categories of action and therefore wanted to re remove the four con injunctive relief injunctive injunctive relief damages and other relief available under law from all three sections, and that's what this um, amendment does, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Senator Michiki. Is there further discussion on amendment number five? Hearing none, I will withdraw my objection. Is there further objection to amendment number five? Hearing none, amendment number five labeled A.10 is adopted. And finally, up would be amendment number six. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I move amendment number six. This is again, a kind of collaboration between Senator Hughes and Senator Michiki. Um, this was the issue that I've been talking about on the intersex condition. I wanted to clarify that there are cases we want our young people to belong. We want them to have activities when it's of no fault of their own for physiological issues associated with an intersex condition. Oh, <laughs> I object for discussion. Okay, you want, me to, you want me to start over? <laughs> Not necessarily. Just <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was important that those young people know that we are we are with them. We want them to belong and to be successful. And this clarifies that this bill does not uh, modify their rights under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or ADA issues. Um, so if you're out there, you're worried about this bill, you have a condition that is beyond your control, this bill um, will protect your rights for participation all right amendment number six by senator hughes and senator machiki labeled number six a.11 i object for discussion is there further discussion without further discussion i'll withdraw my objection is there further objection without objection amendment number six labeled a.11 is adopted or that's the end of the amendments are there further amendments to SB 140. Hearing no further amendments, is there further debate on SB 140? Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll go to Senator Stevens and then Senator Begich. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I really appreciate the discussion. I've learned a lot here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to support um, this bill in moving out. Um, I am concerned, though, that it has not received um, a judiciary uh, hearing. 
so many of the issues we're dealing with here are constitutional. It's been mentioned several times. Um, a violation of the Constitution possibilities. I think that um, it, sh it, it deserves a hearing uh, with judiciary, but obviously it's not going to get that. Uh, this bill goes uh, to, if it passes here, goes to uh, rules. I will certainly, if there are votes to move it on the floor, I will certainly, as chairman of rules, will certainly make sure that it, uh, it, it receives a hearing on the floor. But again, my concern is that um, there are issues here that transcend education. I love the Education Committee. I've been on it ever since it was created. My bill created the Education Committee uh, several years ago because it was with health and social services. We have a responsibility. We have areas that, are, that, are, that only education should be dealing with. But I think this bill sort of transcends some of those, and that's why I believe it deserves a Judiciary Committee hearing. Again, it's not going to hear that. It's not going to happen. I will vote for it, but I just want to raise that uh, concern. Thank you, Senator Stevens. Senator Begich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I completely agree with Senator Stevens' comments and, and would just add that I'm not so certain it won't receive a judiciary hearing. I certainly will do my best to try to ensure that this bill gets a judiciary referral. That is a right of the full body, and it's my intent to try to exercise that right. Um, that said, I think that uh, the bill is chasing a problem that doesn't exist. I think that this, as as Billy Strickland, our Association of Alaska uh, Student Activities head has said, I think that this bill is designed, for, yeah, if we put as much time, Mr. Chairman, into this bill as we, we should be doing in a fiscal plan, we'd actually have a fiscal plan. At this point, I'm, I'm disappointed that we're moving forward with this legislation. I'm disappointed that we've used the time that we have for it. I actually, because I'm not present, don't get a vote on whether or not this bill moves out. Um, if I did have a vote, I would be opposing it, and um, I wish I could be there in person, but the regulations prohibit it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Begich. Is there further discussion from the committee? Mr. Chairman, I'll just Senator Chicky. make it brief. This is a tough one, and it's not a tough one for the, I mean, the obvious goal I support. It's, uh, and I, I would have... Um, I mean, I think we dealt with a lot of the judiciary issues in this um, committee, but I, had I known what we were going to face in this bill, I certainly would have assigned it there earlier. I uh, didn't. We, we dealt with a lot of the issues, and, and that's where we are today. But I, I can't stress it enough about ensuring that young people that are uh, don't fit the normal mold um, have activities, sports save lives. Sometimes people just don't fit somewhere else and they find something they love and it may not be in the classroom. It, it might be in the art room. It might be in the shop. It might be in sports. It might be in some sort of extracurricular activity. And I certainly hope that we will have options for all young people, no matter um, what category they fit into. I think we put some protections in this bill, or at least certainly outlined that those protections exist under federal law. Um, but uh, I just want those young people to realize that this is uh, not a personal thing. It's simply my vote on this will be to separate and defend um, female sports from clearly medically biological males and uh, Anyway, I'll just leave it at that, but I know some people will identify it otherwise. I just wanted to make sure that people understood where I stood personally. Thank you, Senator Machicki. Senator Hughes, as the sponsor, would you care to use this time as your closing remarks as well? I can certainly do that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to thank the committee very much and, and the chair. It's It's um, been a good exercise. I think we improved the bill with the amendments. Um, we strengthify, strengthened, clarified things, and actually, in doing so, um, put to rest some of the constitutional concerns, although I I'm, I'm, uh, understand Senator Begich doesn't fully agree with that. As far as um, needing another committee of referral, I would like to highlight to other members who may not be aware, um, because this is a national conversation, of course, other states, I think we're up to 12 or 13, have been considering this. And most of those have only had one committee of referral, and that being the Education Committee. 
I want to remind all of us, we all take an oath to the Constitution, and every bill we look at, we consider that in every committee. And I have been, over the years that I've served in the House and the Senate, in various committees, whether it was labor and commerce or resources, um, state affairs, uh, constitutional issues do arise and are, are addressed in that committee of referral. And typically, we do not add a, a judiciary uh, referral to them. Now, I understand that the opposition to this bill is using the, the constitutional kind of things as their case for it. But I do think that we've, we've done a fine job of building, building the case that this is solid. And um, in speaking with our expert attorneys who are very knowledgeable about case law, federal law, and the Constitution, they actually have expressed um, confidence that uh, a bill such as this would be withheld, uh, un would, would withstand constitutional scrutiny as well as be upheld by the Supreme Court. So I, I just want to get that on the record. I also want to address the fact that um, uh, Senator Begich has brought up as far as uh, whether there is a present uh, situation right now in our state. And actually, um, we as legislators aren't just called to fix problems, we're, we're called to prevent them. And what we want to do is we want to give assurance to the young girls and the women now that are coming through grade school and middle school so that they know that if they work hard and, and invest, and you know, some of these high school girls, they'll get pretty serious when it comes to athletic training and their diets and working out. We want them to know um, that they will continue to have what Title IX has afforded to us over the years. And so um, it's important, I think, for us to address this now and not wait till we have a situation. Because this, this is not, again, this is not about excluding anyone from participating. This is about ensuring that all, all students will have a chance to be included with two options, that being a team aligned with their a biological sex or a co-ed team. And, and so I, I think it is the right time. I think waiting would be a mistake and delaying it uh, would be problematic for the young girls and women out there. They're looking to, to us to make sure they are not discriminated against. And I'm afraid that if we don't set a policy like this, that girls and women's sp sports as we know them will change. They will be eroded. And so um, I appreciate the support of the committee committee members, and I look forward to the bill moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Um, having uh, finished your closing remarks, uh, I will look to Senator Stevens for the will of the committee. Mr. Chairman, I move that Senate Education Committee substitute for Senate Bill 140 Work Order 32-LS0911 forward slash A, as amended, be reported from the committee with individual recommendations and attached fiscal notes. Is there an objection? Without objection, Senate Bill 140 has been reported for the committee as amended with individual recommendations and attached fiscal notes. Um, we will sign the paperwork after adjourning the meeting as we're up to the end of the time here. We have a floor session imminent. Is there any other business before the committee? Seeing none, our next meeting is Friday, April 5th at 9 a.m. And at this time, we are adjourned at 1046 a.m.